Let's start speaking this week. Okay, I'm pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jerry Schuster, who will be talking to us today about machine learning. Jerry is a former professor in our department, so he's uh, well known to some of you in the audience, but for those of you who don't know Jerry, here's some background on him. So Jerry completed a PhD in applied geophysics in 1984 at the Henry Crumb School of Mines at Columbia University. Uh, after graduating, Jerry spent a year uh, in Columbia as a postdoc and then joined the faculty here in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Utah. Jerry was a professor of geophysics in our department for 24 years from 1985 until 2009. In 1987, Jerry founded the Utah Tomography and Modeling Slash Migration Consortium, and he continued to direct it until 2009. This industry consortium funded many graduate students and postdocs who did a lot of groundbreaking work in exploration seismology and even earthquake seismology. Jerry left our department in 2009 to become a geophysics professor at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia, otherwise known as KAUST. To put that year in perspective, Jerry left the same year that our department moved into the Sutton building here. So Jerry has maintained his ties with our department since then. He had an adjunct faculty appointment here in the department, uh, I think pretty much the whole time that he was on the faculty at KAUST. Uh, Jerry retired from KAUST this year and is now back living in Salt Lake City again. So Jerry has many accomplishments. I'll just mention a few of them. I'll start with uh, being twice the winner of our department's Distinguished Teaching Award and once the winner of the Distinguished Research Award. <laughs> In addition to being the author or uh, co-author of many journal articles, Jerry has written three books, one on seismic interferometry published in 2009, one on seismic inversion published in 2017, and one on machine learning and geosciences that will be published soon. Uh, Jerry was the editor of the journal Geophysics from 2004 to 2005. The Society of Exploration Geophysicists awarded him their Virgil Kaufman Gold Medal in 2010 for his work in seismic interferometry. So Jerry has lots of experience with distinguished lectures. He's given a number of them here. Uh, he was a distinguished lecturer for the Society of Petroleum Engineers from 1988 to 1999, or 1998 to 99, and for SEG in 2013. So let's welcome Jerry Schuster back for today's distinguished lecture. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim forgot to mention, he not only is my friend and colleague, but also a mentor for me when I first came. He taught me how, to, and my student, how to write more precise, precisely. <laughs> I remember the first PhD dissertation I edited, or one of the first, and Jim was a uh, co-advisor on that. And after I finished editing the first draft for my student, Jim had a shot at it and it became all red after that. So then I realized how to write a little bit more precisely. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for taking the time to attend my uh, seminar here. So I'm gonna talk about semi-universal geocrack detection by machine learning. And these are my co-authors. And um, three of them are from the GG department. One is Dan Trentman. Uh, he retired a few years ago. He was the I brought him over to uh, cows to help train our machine learning algorithm by picking faults on images. And also Ron Brun helped us as well by providing uh, definitions and geology sanity checks on what we're doing as well as some pictures. And then there's me. 
So where is this uh, place of KAUST, Kenya Dual University of Science Technology? It's right there on the border uh, between, across the border between uh, Egypt and Sudan, a little bit uh, south of that border. It's about 50 miles north of Jeddah. And I'm gonna concentrate most of our machine learning work on images taken in Saudi Arabia in a World, World Heritage site, which is called Al Ula, which is about the six hour drive from, uh, from our campus. And I was last there in December on a camping trip, but we had done this work about four years ago with uh, drones. So it looks a lot like Southern Utah, except uh, you add some archeology span that's pretty obvious. And this is a part of the Nabataean civilization that built this. If you saw one of the Indiana Jones uh, movies up there in Petra, this Nabataean civilization is connected to that. They're all one and the same. And this is some of the, uh, one of the reasons why they uh, just recently named this a World Heritage Site. And to convince you it looks like uh, Southern Utah, looks almost like arches. There's us on our December camping trip last uh, year. Uh, with a couple of graduate students and postdoc. There's an arch here. And there's a, a, that looks in a place that looks almost like uh, Goblin Valley, but a little bit more elongated. So uh, motivation and introduction. Why should we be interested in something as boring as detecting cracks of crying out loud cracks? Okay, well, there's many reasons because as uh, geological structures and man-made objects start to decay, they develop stress because of stresses, they develop cracks in their surfaces. And uh, one of the uh, ones that's very practical in the city of Utah and other cities is uh, uh, block cracks or cracks, alligator cracks, edge cracks, and they have about five or more different types of cracks. They're very interested in not only detecting, but also classifying. I know this to be true because uh, my daughter is attending a machine, uh, well, she got her master's degree in computer science here a few years ago. And one of her intern projects was to go to the city, city uh, people. And her project was to take photos of, uh, from cars and to use machine learning to detect the cracks, see how many they were and the density and so on. So they can figure out how to fix them the following year or maybe the, that summer and how they detect the cracks. There's many ways of doing it. One is by a laser, uh, a laser device on top of the car, or you just use uh, GoPros and the front bumper. And she was using the images from GoPros at the time. Uh, another possible reason why cracks might be of interest is uh, you might be able to detect imminent data, uh, dam uh, collapses. This is a picture of the Teton Dam, which uh, collapsed about in the 60s or in the 70s. Uh, and it's made the dam is a natural earth dam and uh, mainly of volcanic rocks and you get cracks there, uh, natural, but then they grow in time if you have an imminent dam collapse. And one of the reasons uh, you like to use AI or machine learning to detect such cracks is it may be growing every day and you might send a drone out there and almost immediately get real time results on how the crack is growing and perhaps when to start sounding the alarm. Other reasons you might want to uh, determine the tectonics of an area. This is a geological uh, uh, rendering of the geology of Mars, a portion of Mars. And a blow up of that area is from the Mars orbital uh, camera. And if you'd like to detect the cracks for in, these, in these cases, they look like they're uh, fissures and faults. You can do that by machine learning. And not only get the uh, images of the cracks automatically detected, but also a quantitative estimate of their main orientations, as you can see here with this rosette diagram. And this is the kind of stuff we do in our uh, machine learning course. Another reason uh, for detecting uh, cracks is by fan blades. The airplane I came in last night uh, uh, used such a fan uh, set up like this. And the old way of doing it is take every so often, uh, the FAA de uh, uh, demands that you uh, look at the, blades for cracks and the old way of doing it is by visual inspection, but now they have machines that do this and coupling machines, uh, mainly laser machines and acoustic uh, vibrating machines to detect cracks. You also use, starting to use machine learning algorithms. And also construction, and this was the motivation for our work in Aula. Uh, a company uh, contacted us at KAUST about four years ago or so. 
And uh, they were contracted by the government of Saudi Arabia to develop the Aula World Heritage Site. And by developing it, one of the objectives was to start drilling into the rock there, the masses, and make sure that they don't uh, cause a landslide or a crumbling of the rock around them. So they had to detect the, the density of rocks, uh, of cracks in this area, and they gave us the assignment. And this happens to be the, uh, the red lines correspond to the cracks our machine learning algorithm uh, was able to come up with. And what they wanted to do eventually was start drilling into the uh, massive and start using it for whatever purpose for the tourists. So now the introduction to Aula. So this is an aerial map of the Aula site that they were interested in. Uh, the red line here corresponds to uh, one massive. There's two massives they wanted us to determine the crack density of. This one and this little cro croissant type shaped crack. Uh, two big massives, 100 meters high. Looks very much like Southern Utah, as you can see here. And there's a car for our scale. The problem is to find the cracks, not only on the side, but on the tops. And so one of our groups, one of the groups at KAUST uh, was an expert in uh, uh, drones and images and processing them. And once they did the uh, processing of the uh, images, they gave it to us for the machine learning detection of cracks. And this is a before picture, the raw picture, and this is the after picture of our machine learning algorithm. The problem with this is you had 23,000 uh, photos, uh, high density photos to determine the cracks and bring together into one uh, large uh, general picture of the area. Now, uh, you really could not hire enough people at that time and you didn't have enough time to hand label the cracks. And that's where machine learning came in. We hired a few people, I hired a few people. One of them was Dan Tremmen, brought him over to uh, KAUST and they spent on the order of two to three months taking 100 photos, 100, 110 photos out of those 23,000, broke them up into smaller subphotos, and then spent several months uh, outlining where the cracks are. And that was the uh, base data set we used to train our machine learning algorithm. So what kind of uh, effort was used to uh, get the images? Well. Here we see the massive I showed you before, and these green lines correspond to the tracks of the uh, uh, drone that was used. And these little, uh, if you can see them, little dots correspond where you had to stop the drone, change the batteries, or download the images and put in some new uh, cards into the drone and set it off again. So this took about one to two weeks uh, to do 36 flights that you see here around the uh, massive, one massive. Then you also had to do flights on top of the massive, 14 flights here. And this is about a one kilometer scale. And then the other croissant shaped massive, they had seven flights. You really couldn't, uh, well, you didn't have that much of an exposure along the sides there. And you had 13 flights for the top. In total, over 23,000 high density images that were anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 pixels to 3,000 to 4,000 pixels, An enormous, data set we had to use. So the old way of detecting cracks is the following. You usually uh, did a deterministic edge detection filter. And here we see a picture of a raw, mass, raw massive. And we use a, uh, well, you could use, we didn't use it in practice, but you could, you could use a uh, deterministic edge detection filter where basically you are taking the values of intensities of pixels along one vertical slice here, a short one, three pixels tall, and subtracting the intensity values from its neighboring pixels, three pixels tall. That's what this does, simply an averaging filter. And if you have homogeneous uh, values of intensity, such as in this lower area here, where you don't see many cracks, you get zero for your output. If you see a very rapid change in the intensity value before a crack, it's a bright picture. At the crack, it's a very dark picture. You're gonna get a very large difference in the intensity values. However, this works somewhat for the cracks here, but also will make a lot of mistakes, such as along the skyline here. The yellows are the mistakes, the reds are what you might expect to be the true crack 
uh, locations. So you have to follow this deterministic filter with a lot of manpower to figure out where you made the mistakes, make the corrections, and then you come up with the true features in that image. Well, if you have to do that 23,000 times, that's not gonna work. You don't have that kind of time or manpower available. <clears throat> As a way to overcome this problem, uh, you can use convolutional neural networks. And it's a combination of weighted edge detection filters and intu intuition built into the machine. And here's how it works on a, on a very broad picture scale. Here's the input. Here's the output. How do we get the output? Well, we hired Dan Trepman and a few others to go ahead and label what we thought were the true cracks here in red. Here's the input, the raw picture. And in between, we put the mathematics and we call that UNET. I'll explain that in a little bit. And we're gonna combine now the edge detection filter with the uh, intuition of the machine on what's the mistake and what's correct. Now, the thing about the convolutional neural network is the fact that it's not gonna just have ones here and minus ones for the weights on the edge detection filter. It'll figure out the best weights. And notice that I went from ones here on the red column here to all to reds that are 0.5, one and 0.5, all the same sign. And over here, we have a different set of numbers as well, but all the same sign. That may be better and avoid the yellow mistakes we see up here than just having a homogeneous set of ones here and a homogeneous set of minus ones here. Similarly, this is a edge detection filter for horizontal cracks. You can see uh, the basic one would be uh, a row of red ones and a row of blue minus ones. That may not be good enough to detect the true ones and distinguish them from the uh, false ones. So it will find the best weights. In this case, I'm just making this up. The weights might be something else. And that's what the convolutional neural network does. It finds the best weights that doesn't make many mistakes. It will make mistakes, but not many of them compared to the original deterministic one. How did it do this? Well, what you do is you set up a, uh, an objective function. And notice the objective function is the difference between the predicted cracks and the labeled cracks. So the labeled cracks are here. You might think of the, the image here as a bunch of pixels with either ones or, or zeros. Ones correspond to cracks, zeros correspond to no cracks. So those are given. Here are the predicted cracks. How do we predict the cracks? Well, our predicted cracks are obtained from the mathematics associated with the convolutional neural network. And instead of assigning fixed weights here, these are gonna be unknown weights. Instead of a minus 0.5, it'll be W sub one. Instead of a minus one here, it'll be a W sub two and so on. So these will be the unknowns. And what you do is you cycle this input into a starting values of weights here. It'll give you an answer, and then you subtract that answer, predicted weights minus the label cracks. And if the answer is too big, it'll take that residual and go back and readjust the weights until you minimize this objective function. You can think of this as a uh, misfit function. And that's the key idea between convolutional neural networks, and we call it supervised learning because it's supervised because Dan Trentman et al. has to spend a few months taking uh, several hundred pictures, or in his case, several thousand sub-pictures and labeling them. Let me show you an example. Here's some raw pictures from our network after training. And here's the labeled pictures after training. Raw, label. And then we took these pictures, which are mainly uh, obtained from a sandstone formation, and use our neural network that was already trained in Saudi Arabia. And we took those weights, we brought them over to Idaho, around 8,000 miles away. And we tested to see if they would work on the Idaho uh, images here. And they worked okay, not perfect, but okay. You see a, a change in colors here because an output of the neural network will give you a probability estimate of whether that's a correct or an incorrect crack detection. The redder it is, the higher the probability, the whiter it is, the less probability. 
Now, this is the methodology part. <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit of technical detail. So those who aren't too familiar with uh, CNN can just squeeze their eyes shut and wait for about five minutes till I get to the uh, results. And while you're squeezing your eyes shut, waiting for me to get to the results, I have to now advertise the course I'm going to be teaching. I think I'm going to be teaching this next semester. I haven't gotten the number for it. It's going to be uh, denoted as machine learning geosciences. Spring semester is going to be three hours, two one and a half hour lectures per week, and included will be the labs. That's all project oriented. We try to get uh, projects done because that's how you really learn by doing a project. And in some cases, it turns into a published paper. And uh, the it'll be be based on the uh, the book, which was supposed to be published this year, but because of technical and financial reasons, at SEG. Uh, has been delayed until early 2023. Okay, so squeeze your eyes shut if you don't want to hear the technical details. First thing uh, we need to do is we have to cha change our data set from just a random bunch of pictures of cracks and no cracks to a balanced data set. And what do I mean by a balanced data set? Well, we have to have as many cracks that occupy the picture and area wise as non cracks. And we don't get that just by taking a random selection of pictures because a lot of the pictures, uh, they are just homogeneous looking uh, fields here, 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 and so on. And then some of the pictures have cracks and some of them have a high density of cracks. But we gotta make sure that we have the same number of pictures here for cracks as we do, or at least occupying the same area as we do with homogeneous portions of the image. That's sort of like a teacher, you know, you have a, a classroom of students and maybe 5% of them are geniuses and the rest are non-geniuses. So they take the average of the class uh, capabilities and you go, well, I'm gonna to teach to them, you know, like the, the average, you know, uh, motivation intelligence level of a student, but that's gonna bore the, uh, the geniuses. So what that person ought to do is kind of say, okay, let's develop our course. So it addresses almost equally uh, the teaching difficulties to both the average as well as the genius likes. And then both groups hopefully will be happy. The same thing with uh, training your network. You need an equal balanced number of cracks in your pictures as well as the you know, homogeneous parts of your pictures. Uh, how do we do this? Uh, one way to do this is a thing called uh, augmentation. We take uh, pictures of cracks like this and then we start rotating the picture, making it look a little bit different, maybe stretching it this way and that way and rotating in different areas, maybe even uh, changing the intensity value a bit as well. And we get extra pictures with cracks in them that we might not have had before. And to put in a 3000 by 5000 uh, pixel picture into, the, into, the, into your computer is not easy. Uh, so what we have to do is we break up the pictures into 200 by 300 sub pictures. And so each large picture here gets put in as a sub picture. And these little sub, these little blue rectangles correspond to a sub picture. Okay. And some of the sub pictures overlap with one another. And uh, you think this is going to be a complicated procedure, but if you take my course next semester, you'll be doing this uh, in your sleep. These are the only lines of code you need in Keras to be able to execute something like this. Okay, and this is where you really have to squeeze your eyes shut if you don't want these kind of details, but the go-to architecture for medicine, as well as it seems to be uh, geophysics and geology is a UNET CNN architecture. And it's not based on Utah. You know, we're developing our own architecture that we're trying to call the Utah type architecture, but it hasn't quite hit the publications yet, but this is developed uh, by the medical community about uh, around 2015 or so. Uh, seven years ago, and has proved to be a real hit in the medical community for analyzing uh, their CAT scans and MRI scans and so on. And, if, and about uh, four years later, the geophysics community picked up on this, and this is really an effective architecture. And all those weights that I showed you in a very simple fashion in the earlier slides, well, those weights are now occupying this tall, long slice here. Instead of just being three weights along a column, now we have maybe a couple hundred to a thousand weights that are unknown in each of these columns. So you can get up to uh, more than a million weights associated with your what we call the uh, UNet architecture. 
And it's a semantic segmentation network. And what that means is every pixel is going to be classified. Every pixel in this huge picture is going to be classified as either a fault or a non or a crack or a non-crack. And many weights have to be trained, that is determined by this iterative process of adjusting the weights until you minimize the sum of the squared errors. And notice that the, 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 the boxes here are much smaller than the boxes up here. That's because there's very few weights to train. We go from a very uh, fine, high resolution parts of the image to very coarse, low resolution parts of the image, kind of like a multi-grid procedure for solving PDEs. And here's our output that we want to train it to have just the whites correspond to where the cracks are, the blacks correspond to where the cracks are not, ones and zeros. And so how can you recover a 64 by 64 image from a four by four feature map? Well, no problem. Here's where you really reduce the number of unknowns to hardly anything, just a four by four feature map, we call it. Mm -hmm. How do you get a four by four feature map to get this kind of detail? Well, you get that kind of detail by building bridges across the unit, okay? And that means this information up here is preserved by sending it over to here and it's waiting for the onset of the information from below the unit. Okay, that's that's a lot of detail for, too much detail for the non-expert. Okay, um, one of the ways we also um, accounted for an imbalanced data set is uh, in our objective function, Part of the objective function was weighted a lot less than the other part. One part was for cracks, pictures with cracks. The other part is for areas of the picture that were non-cracks. And so we downweighted the pictures with non-cracks, effectively uh, doing the same thing as augmentation, but I think in a more realistic way. We trained on a GPU, one workstation. So uh, we didn't need a supercomputer for this. And our training took less than a day on a very powerful GPU on one workstation about four years ago. We use the code Keras. We'll be using that in my course this coming semester. And uh, it's an online, uh, everyone gets a free GPU for thanks to Google. You'd log into the site. Google gives you a free GPU. You don't have to have it on your computer. And all the software is there and you'll bang away and uh, not have to wait too much time to get things done. And how you determine if you're done or not, you develop this objective function I showed you before, we call that the loss function. We plot it against the epoch or the iteration number. Instead of using epoch, iteration number, machine learning community, they use epoch. And we can see that the uh, objective function or the loss function goes down in value as you iterate down to this value here, we call around point, just below 0.025. And what we did was to take the original training data set and we divided it up into two pieces. 80% uh, roughly is going to be for training, that is finding the Ws, the correct coefficients for your edge detection filter. And then the other 20%, you leave them untouched. And you randomly grab those from that original uh, data set that Dan had out um, labeled. And then you take the untouched but labeled set, the 20% remaining, and then applied the trained neural network to it to see if it was, it was able to uh, bring down the loss in the same way as it did for the uh, original 80% training set. And indeed, in this case, it did, and we're happy with the results. They're about the same level. Okay, here are the results. You can open your eyes, those who are not used to this, and here we go with some results. And they're not too surprising. Um, we had over about a 95% accuracy in detecting the cracks. And by that, we have a quantitative estimate as well as we go back to the label data and we say, okay, what's, what do we think the human interpreter would uh, actually label? We got over a 95% accuracy. And you can see that on these pictures here. Sometimes we make mistakes because we didn't care about those mistakes. This is, uh, this is a tracks from a car. You can see the car down here maybe and it labeled the tracks from the car. We didn't care about that. We knew where the car was. We could have easily gotten rid of that by training the machine learning algorithm to ignore car tracks, but no point to that. Now, that was, the, that was mainly sandstone geology that uh, our algorithm was able to detect cracks on. And we thought, okay, uh, why don't we go 8,000 miles um, west 
and go to Idaho. And thanks to Ron Brune, he suggested going to Idaho because there was a uh, dam site that, that had collapsed and killed some people. And it was uh, formed primarily from the geology of uh, volcanic eruptions that had occurred many, many years before. And you can read it, the Teton Dam in eastern Idaho failed catastrophically on the morning of 1976 in June. And a larger low down the Snake River Plain engulfing small villages, the city of Expert and so on. And here's a uh, picture that he gave us uh, of, the, uh, of the site of the, of the reconstructed dam after it uh, failed. Here are volcanic rocks and the kind of cracks there um, or look like cracks from the sandstone, but except they're going to be different. These, this is a different geology now. What do they look like? Well, they look like something like that. And after our machine learning algorithm was applied to it, it did an okay job, but not a great job. It probably had no more than an 80% accuracy on that. But we didn't want to go through several months of training a new uh, algorithm. So what we did was to, um, and we knew they were uh, not the best results in the world because here are cracks. If you look carefully, you can see other cracks it missed. There and here, these are two different pictures from that side view. And you can see the missed ones there, just by eyeball. I'm gonna go back. You can see the yellows are the ones we had missed. Why? Because the sandstone uh, UNET was trained on sandstone, not on volcanics. And we didn't want to have to go through all this training all over again. So we had a better idea. And the better idea came from the machine learning community and they call it transfer training. Here's our old UNET. And maybe you can't recognize it for those who close their eyes, but this is the big U architecture. The brains are in here and the brains are the weights we, we train for. So there's weights at the high resolution level and there's weights at the low resolution level. One might think that the low resolution level, the very coarse, uh, features of cracks in sandstone are probably common to both Idaho and and uh, and um, and uh, Saudi Arabia. The high resolution features are probably not going to be common. So what we did was to break up our weights into frozen weights that we kept from Saudi Arabia, and those are the blue ones. Sandstone weights frozen down here, and we then retrained on much less data the top level part of the U, the weights associated with them. So down, down below are the frozen ones in blue, not surprisingly, the color blue. And that constituted what we kept over from the sandstone training in Saudi Arabia. And the new training, many fewer images were needed, many, much, much fewer effort by our uh, folks on the order of magnitude, much fewer effort on training, labeling things. And this is very similar to uh, the, uh, this is an image from the old movie. Anybody can guess what movie this is from? Only the older folks probably. What? Young there we go, Young Frankenstein. Okay, Young Frankenstein, for those who aren't familiar with the movie or the old story, uh, Frankenstein is a, an assembly of an old body that had died and some brain they, they grabbed from the, uh, from the, from the graves. And that's what, that's what we're doing. We're taking the old body we got from, that was dead. Dead because it only was alive really in a useful way for Saudi Arabia sandstone geology. We kept that body low, low, low resolution. And we attached to it the high resolution head from a very limited amount of training from the Idaho pictures. And that's called transfer training. We didn't invent this. So this is, we found, we figured, it was kind of floating around the community a few years ago and we just borrowed it. So let's see what happened. So here's the results from Idaho dam results by sandstone UNET and transfer training. Okay. Okay, here's our old results and some mistakes. And here's our new mistake, who new results after transfer training. In order of magnitude, less effort. Here's the before, and here's our Frankenstein experiment. So you can probably focus your attention on a few cracks and you can see that we're probably okay before and after. So what does this mean? Well, in practical matters, it means that someone, ought, some young graduate ought to start a company that looks for in real time geohazards. 
such as uh, imminent failure in dams, landslides, and other things that require uh, a great deal of real-time attention to sound the alarm. And you think it's easier than you think it's done. One of the, uh, one of the students at Cal formed their own uh, drone company. It's very successful after about five or six years. It has five or more million dollars a year in revenues right now doing drone work around Saudi Arabia, doing all kinds of uh, efforts, uh, doing useful things, in including finding cracks in oil pipelines by sending the drone over the, they have big pipelines that go over a thousand miles long in Saudi Arabia, and they need to know where things are leaking or not leaking. And then we got ambitious and uh, we went to maybe 90 million miles away and sometimes a year uh, to Mars. And we looked at, uh, here's a geological picture of, of a, a portion of Mars uh, and how is it obtained? Well, you took a small portion of it and from the Mars orbital uh, photographs, we got that. And then we applied the uh, sandstone semi-universal crack detector with no transfer training. And we were able to get a rough estimate of the cracks in that picture. Not only get a rough estimate of the cracks in the picture, once you have these red lines here, it's just a three-line MATLAB code to develop your rosette diagram to figure out what the major strikes are of the, of the cracks, or in this case, probably fractures or faults. And that says something about the linear tectonics associated with Mars. So in conclusion, uh, UNET plus transfer training, we believe provides opportunities for geoscientists who take my class. They actually, in my class, they have uh, some of the, some of the labs are with the Aula examples and other geological examples. Uh, it's a semi-universal crack detector. And one of the labs is also uh, transfer training. It can be used to crack some sandstones or volcanic rocks, and maybe it can be extended to other types of geology as well with good performance. After a little labeling, uh, transfer training can uh, retrain your UNET and uh, get good results for different geology, we found. Uh, the UNET can even uh, detect uh, geological features from Mars over to photos. It can be even refined with greater accuracy with a little bit of effort and a real-time hazard assessment by monitoring dams, volcanoes, structures, et cetera, and perhaps, and should perhaps be used by some of the rovers on Mars to detect possible hazards uh, because there's a, like a, on the order of a 10 minute lag between communication of going one way between Mars and Earth. Uh, you need to know where the, where the um, possible hazards are in real time. And this is the kind of thing that can be done, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm applied to what's seen in the camera. And future, I think, is uh, those those uh, ge geologists. I mean, anybody in the earth sciences and machine learning is going to give you more uh, more opportunities to do more with massive amounts of data, and that's our future, if not currently as well. We have very fast internet now. We have huge disk drives that are cheap, and we now have access to images that just overwhelm our you know terabytes of data, and pretty soon zettabytes of data are going to be used in and um, in our field courses. And we showed examples in Idaho and Mars. And one example I didn't show you, a few years ago, I went down to uh, Westminster College. They have these, um, these cameras out in the uh, Great Salt Lake, and they're trying to find the population of different types of birds there. And I know they have tens of thousands, if not by now, millions of photos there. And I went to them about three years ago. I, I, went to the director and said, hey, look, I bet my class can detect the type of birds. You don't need somebody to say that's a robin or that's a duck or you know, et cetera. And they said, no, because it's a, you know, it's a public outreach thing and you know, it's good for the public to get involved and so on. But so anyway, um, that person would not let me have access to the photos. So I went back and during COVID, I, you know, I had to sit in my, my dining room and I had a big window there and I had my camera out there and I had a population of about at least 10 to 15 species of birds that would come down and peck on my chair I put food on. And so I took a, you know, on the order of 500 or more pictures of birds over the last year during COVID. And in my class about two years ago, that was one of the projects assigned. Uh, and someone took it up. She's from Lebanon, never heard of machine learning. By the end of the class, she was able to achieve identification of all my photos in my backyard 
over 500, with over 95% accuracy, the type of bird it was. And she used a training set of maybe 50 to 100 photos for that to take place. So you can do lots of other things that are related to the environment. And this is one of them. And there's papers, there's just recent papers showing in Hong Kong, they do this now to, to monitor bird population and how it rises or falls depending on the environmental conditions. And also we developed, an, an, probably not this class in the spring, we developed some new fancy algorithms I call the Geo Fourier transform, which is machine learning applied to uh, images. And here we're trying to detect and reconstruct old geology. This is a picture of Enceladus, one of the moons out there. I think it's Saturn, if I'm not mistaken, Enceladus. Anyway, so um, here we, ha we have old geology, these, uh, these um, moon, no, actually new geology, these moon craters, or these craters from meteorites. And we're able to uh, use that as a basis function in our machine learning algorithm and get rid of them and see what the old geology look like. We can do that with cracks there as well. So here's before and after. It's going to be very difficult to use a standard Fourier transform to do anything like this, to be able to do anything beyond just straight line type filtering. So uh, all of our, we are now, I think geophysics is learning a lot from machine learning community. One of the things machine learning community does is they, they uh, not only publish rapidly, like they go to this site, X archive, and so the day you get your final results, you don't have to send it to a reviewer, you just send it out there and you get your, get your date on it. And then eventually someone might review it, but you get your, your, your results quickly out there in the public. And I asked one of the machine learning experts, why do you guys do this without review? Are you kidding? If you wait more than three months, you're behind the times already to wait for your paper to get published, you know, for better or for worse. So, but one thing we're learning from the machine learning community, when you have results, you should have reproducible results. That's something we've been kind of negligent with geophysics. You get all these fancy results from your algorithm, nobody can reproduce it. So one thing we do now is we take all our code and we have a paper in machine learning type algorithm. We put it out there on the web so people can look at it, test it and see if, you know, we're just, you know, if what we're saying is correct. And they can test it on their own type of data as well. So again, uh, finally, a reminder to the students and postdocs or whatever, if you're going to register for the course, uh, it's going to be three hours long. It's going to be uh, project oriented. And the best results I have found is if the advisors assign one of their students to the course. So they learn the, the basics of machine learning. And uh, they also might have some data they might want to turn into a project. So they can use it as a project. An example, um, Patrick here. I had a project with Patrick and uh, Frank about uh, 20 years ago, was it? Yeah. When I was teaching signal processing, image processing, and we used deterministic algorithms. We're trying to find BOMAs in, uh, in Kenya. Yeah. And yeah, you know, our results were kind of da, da, da. And he was supposed to come up with the final results and he never had time. <laughs> so I could blame myself for not doing it. But anyway, we, we never finished it. So uh, I taught this course to a worldwide audience about two or three years ago. And by worldwide, we had over 120 people sign up around the world. We had literally, I had to teach it two different times. Uh, one for the uh, Chinese, the Asian, Middle East, European time zone. Then I had to teach another course that same week, the duplicate course for the North American, South American time zone. And we had people from Columbia, we had people from Princeton, we had people from various universities, Michigan State. And the uh, research professor at Columbia took up the BOMA project. And I mean, he has a lot to do and he was able to get someplace. But just like you and me, we just ran out of time. And he said, oh, if I had a student to do this, I would you know, really knock it out, out of the ballpark. And I think things can be knocked out of the ballpark. And according to Frank and, uh, and um, Patrick, the, you know, finding the BOMA population and density patterns in uh, Kenya might have some, you know, uh, good effects in planning uh, something in Kenya. So I know Patrick's gonna take the course and he's gonna finish that BOMA project using the modern machine learning algorithms we'll teach. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'll be 